pleased to welcome you to today's uh, COP15 side event on uh, urban forestry benchmarking. So thank you all for joining. Um, just want to have a check that uh, everyone's hearing me okay, please. Great, thank you very much for that. So um, let me get started today. I'm going to just uh, go through some housekeeping slides. Today's meeting is being interpreted, so we want to make sure that uh, you can find the interpretation channel um, if, if you'll be using that feature. So as you can see here, this is the interface for today's uh, event. And on the bottom, uh, you have an option that says language um, floor. And if you click on that, you may also choose French, Spanish, English or Russian so that you have the opportunity to listen to today's event in the language of your choosing. Now, um, if I could uh, pass the slide, please. Okay, I think that, uh, there we go. Thank you very much. So here we go. Um, as I mentioned, this is what the icon looks like for the floor language. Um, so please go ahead and select the, the right language for you today. Um, we will be having questions and answer. So while most of the, well, I think all the presentations will be in English today, the question and answer will have opportunity for other languages. So if you're listening in English, make sure you choose the English option um, so that uh, you can have that interpretation when needed. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm really pleased again to welcome you to UNEC's meeting today um, with a special thanks to the Swiss Federation for their support for our work on urban forestry and the Trees and Cities Challenge. Next slide, please. Oh, I think here's my controls. There we go. So other, other housekeeping items. Hopefully everyone's on the right channel now for interpretation. If you would like to speak during the question and answer, uh, there's a nice button on the top. Um, you can raise your hand. It's on the side, actually here, it's on the, the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, when you do take the floor, please do turn on your camera and your audio so that we can see you. Uh, you'll only be able to do that when you're given the floor uh, and then you'll be taken off the floor just because we have a limit on the number of people who can speak at a time after you intervene. We do also very much encourage you to share uh, your ideas, exchanges over chat during today's meeting. We've built in a lot of time for this to be uh, interactive with opportunity for question and answer and peer exchange, but of course there's always more opportunity in the chat. In the chat you have the option to translate your languages, so if you see a message in another language that is not one you speak, you may click underneath it to translate the message. It's just to the right of the message that's in another language. Please do ensure to keep your microphones off when you're mute, when you're not speaking, and please also note, as in the invite, that today's meeting is being recorded and will be published. So one more time, here's where you can find everything. And I'll leave that up for a, a second. For the speakers today, you can notice on the bottom left-hand side of this slide is the controls for passing your presentations. So you may need to scroll down in your interface. It says share your screen and then there's some arrows. Those arrows can pass your slides. Single arrow is one slide. The fast forward arrow is 10 slides. Our agenda for today, uh, we have uh, some great experiences that we're going to be sharing. We're starting out uh, with a presentation from our section chief, Ms. Liliana anovatsi jakob uh, who will be providing an introduction for, to, in, to integrative, uh, for urban forestry as an integrative nature-based solution for those who are new to the topic. And uh, I think there's also some, some good content here for those who are old experts. Um, then I will briefly highlight some of the benchmarking goals and opportunities and the background to the work we've been developing over the past year before we really turn over to our experts and hear from uh, our 
excellent speakers from a city perspective, civil society perspective, and an expert perspective. Finally, we'll have a chance for moderated discussion at the end on the objectives of benchmarking. Uh, and this is to inform the finalization of a benchmarking survey we've developed over the past uh, half year or so, um, just to make sure that uh, there's no more objectives that could be integrated into the questionnaire. So with that, I am honored to welcome uh, Ms. Liliana anovatsi jakob the Chief of the UNECE FAO Forestry and Timber Section, for her presentation. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. I lost uh, Daniel for a moment, but um, looks as if I'm, I'm on now. Thank you very much. And um, I assume the slides are going to be changed in Geneva. Is that correct, Daniel? Okay, super. So uh, thanks much for being here today. And thanks much, um, in fact, also for the entire year. Uh, let me take this opportunity to already wish you um, happy holidays and a very good 2023. And thank you very much for all your support and help uh, during this year. It's, it's really indispensable to work with experts like you to drive this agenda and um, to really uh, be able to 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 bring this to to some fruitful outcomes. Um, now, as you know, urban forestry for us is really the integrated nature-based solution um, with an EC region that has 42% of global forests is also highly urbanized um, with 75% in Europe and 80% in North America. Um, the cities are facing the same challenges everywhere. I think there's not a single city in our region that uh, can is, is not part of this uh, loss and fragmentation of urban natural areas or the physical and mental health crisis or climate change impacts, air pollution. So the, the issues are the same. Um, pushing for sustainable urban and peri-urban forestry as an integrated nature-based solution is therefore one of the core components of our efforts and also and i might say i'm currently in montreal um, of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework so this is definitely something that has been recognized and actually right now um, montreal hosts the first city um, um, well a city and 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 region based summit uh, which started yesterday. I will be joining them today, and uh, I look very much forward to also getting this agenda into into the um, global biodiversity framework. Next slide, please. Now, what is urban and peri-urban forestry? Um, we know all that. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, the, the simple definition is really just the woody and associated vegetation in and around urban areas. I think it is important to understand that we are not only talking about trees. It is much more than that, um, and much more than that is needed also for that biodiversity. Um, so. This, I think this definition of really woody and associated veg vegetation in and around urban areas is really very appropriate in this context. Uh, context. So we are in, in, um, in the realm of sustainable urban and peri-urban forestry. Now, what does that mean? Uh, as many of you might know that um, sustainable forestry per se has been around for a very long time but what does it mean in the city context and here really it's the art the science the practice the planning the design um, and also the management of urban and peri-urban forests and trees to meet not only the current needs but also the needs of future generations and uh, that is very important because obviously we all know that trees don't grow, um, often don't grow in one generation. So we really need to plan ahead. Next slide, please. Um, it is important why. Um, a lot of you might have seen this um, this, this circle that, that we developed, a graph that explains it all to you. But 
It is simply important because it helps localize many of the global agendas. Um, and I think by having the first city summit at, at this uh, Montreal meeting here of the Biodiversity Convention, this is really underlined. Um, the localization is, is one of the yeah conditions of success i would say so it's 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 uh, not only important for for uh, the cbd convention but it's important for the sdgs it's it's really important for the climate convention for the sendai framework and all other national and global goals um it can no longer be denied that cities and districts and regions play a very very important go um, role in the global agenda. Next slide, please. UNEC has been actually working on forestry for 75 years, and um, we have been learning a lot from the past, um, as I said, particularly in sustainable forest management. And um, by really trying to build societies and rebuild societies to promote nature and climate positive developments, um, we are also committed to bring this to the urban and peri-urban level and make that really a critical nature-based infrastructure and nature-based solution. Next slide, please. Now, where do we stand today? Just this morning, Daniel informed me that we have now 69 cities worldwide um, that have pledged uh, millions of trees to be planted. But as we all know, this is not enough. Um, it, it seems to be a very cost-effective nature-based solution, but obviously only if um, certain conditions are met. Um, all this is good for the economy, it's good for biodiversity, it's good for health and well-being, it's good for mitigating and adaptation of climate change and disaster risk reduction, but um, certain, certain conditions need to be met. Next slide, please. Long-term planning, long-term management and maintenance, ongoing monitoring adequate investment and and coming here making the link to benchmarking we need to know what is actually there and i think much more than in the um, rural space in the urban space we deal with many different owners it's it's not always just the the government it can be i mean I, I, we were in budapest last week we had a workshop on urban forestry where the city of budapest um, is managing some of the trees, but the rest of the trees are managed by various districts. And the city of Budapest has, in fact, nothing to say about that. So um, it, it, it's quite a complicated and intricate um, relationship that's happening there. So long-term planning together with all, all those involved in tree planting and tree caring is super important. The monitoring is super important. Um, we always say the right tree for the right reasons in the right place. And I might add, and that became very clear last week as well, under the right conditions. Uh, the right conditions have to be created. It's, it's not just enough to choose the right tree. Um, we have to create the right conditions for this tree to survive. We need the money to make it survive. We need the caring to make it survive. Um, so all these conditions that you see here, I think, summarize this quite well. Next slide, please. We've also worked on the 330-300 rule that um, Cecil, whom you probably all know, has uh, developed. It's been taken up by um, even The Guardian, so even major news outlets are, are um, getting to it. Um, this is um, a very simple rule, might not work in all cases, but it's a very simple rule to apply when planning where to where trees are in fact necessary and where they should be. Next slide, please. So we would like to invite you, and as, as I said, many of you have supported us already during this entire year, um, to define your pledge on the Trees in Cities Challenge. I will call for the same also here in Montreal. Um, it's a very simple way to do it, but it's also an official registry that um, that makes things a bit more formal and a bit more higher level. 
Um, you become part of an international registry. Obviously, we give we give you a certificate and, and we let you use that on social media and all other promotional channels. Um, in addition to that, we developed a policy brief on sustainable urban and peri-urban forestry, which is now available also in Russian, French and French, in addition to English. Um, we have a Trees and Cities information brochure available in many languages. And um, we also have a draft regional urban forestry opportunities plan because we think the next level definitely needs to be addressed. Next slide, please. Here you have um, the, the QR codes once again, and I invite, invite you all to join us in this fight for the right tree in the right place for the right reasons and under the right conditions. Next slide. I think this was the last one. And with this, I'm handing over to Daniel. Um, uh, or if you have any other questions, please let me know. Thank you. Daniel? Thank you very much. Okay, I think you can hear me now. Apologies for that. So thank you so much, Liliana, for that uh, overview of urban forestry. Um, as you can see here, we do have a number of ongoing initiatives, and, and I'll speak a, a bit about these uh, in my presentation coming up next as well. Uh, but before we move on to the next presentation, I do want to invite anyone who has questions uh, on Liliana's presentation to raise their hands or to ask a question in the chat. We do have plenty of more opportunities for discussion on benchmarking in uh, after the subsequent presentations and at the end of today's meeting. But anything specifically relating to Liliana's presentation, please feel free to raise your hands now. Um, uh, Liliana is in uh, Montreal, so she will also need to be leaving for, for some other events at COP. Hi, Daniel. Um, many thanks for this uh, webinar. So just a couple of things. When we talk about urban forestry and we talk about definitions, it's really critical that we include people as one of the associates and, and as the biggest challenge creator, actually. But um, I wanted to to address this trees in cities challenge and the 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 issues that i have that i would like addressed is the focus on planting rather than what's already in the ground that we know from observation is struggling to exist so if you are planting more trees and you are not addressing the challenges that the existing material faces you're only adding to the problem. And second of all, that nurseries, given the onslaught of orders that programs such as this generate, are not able to provide the, the kind of material that we should see coming out onto the street or into the cities. It is substandard. And so how do we address this this divide between what nurseries have available and what we are demanding from them. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Naomi. Um, appreciate your comments. They're well noted. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into our subsequent presentations today. Um, one of the things we'll be talking about is political will, which will address some of your comments on the Trees and Cities Challenge. Um, but uh, I, I do think we'll, we'll see basically that there's multiple dimensions here. Um, and the point of today's meeting, as Liliana said, is the right tree in the right place for the right reasons under the right conditions. 
So we fully agree with your comments and, and the role of, of uh, the society in, in trees are, are not there for tree sake, they're also there for the benefits they provide to the society. They are uh, part of an integrated socio-economic, socio-ecological network, excuse me. Um, these are elements that we're seeking to strengthen through our work, as, as I'll get to in the upcoming slides. Um, and the high-level commitments from, from mayors is one way to support uh, the experts on the ground in their work, and, and this is one of the things we're trying to bring out through our work. So without further ado, um, I would like to, I don't see any other comments, so I would like to get into the, that presentation specifically. Um, so this will go over the goals and what we see as opportunities of benchmarking. Uh, so coming to, to my previous point. These are the goals and opportunities that we think inform the draft uh, questionnaire that we've developed for urban forestry benchmarking. And I, I'd like to highlight now that we'll be sharing that questionnaire for comment after today's event um, before we finalize it and send it to cities. And that will take into account the comments from today. And so my presentation now will really focus on how we've arrived at the questions and the structure that we have in, in the questionnaire. But I think it's also very relevant to practitioners who may be thinking about uh, urban forestry benchmarking uh, more broadly. So where is this all coming from? Um, after we launched the Trees and Cities Challenge, we had a number of events that were opportunities for peer learning and exchange among the participating cities. And there was really strong interest in these events and strong engagement, and we wanted to provide a, a more sustainable mechanism for this. And so we created the inform, informal network of experts on sustainable urban forestry. Now this includes our participating cities, but it also includes many experts. And this is, an, this is a forum for knowledge exchange, capacity building, peer-to-peer -peer learning, collaboration uh, among the different uh, members to support the quality of urban forestry, not just the quantitative tree planting pledges that are what get oftentimes political attention. Now, since we founded this last year uh, in October, we've had many meetings. These meetings have not all focused on benchmarking, um, we've had lots of great case studies from our cities, and for those of you who have not already engaged in the network, I do encourage you to do so. We have some uh, QR codes in the presentations, that if, you, if you haven't seen them in the previous ones, uh, so you'll be able to find the links. Um, and out of these meetings, we identified areas that different uh, members of the network thought uh, they need support. So one of the areas that uh, emerged from this was benchmarking. Uh, this is one of the early ideas, excuse me. <coughs> um, from the network and it's something that we first had a, a meeting on in the first half of the year on collaborating on benchmarking where we, where we had a discussion with members of the network about what that might look like and what the priorities might be. Based on that the secretary developed a draft questionnaire and we consulted on that questionnaire uh, with, with experts and then we had a second meeting of our benchmarking collaboration earlier this year in October. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's that time of year. So uh, that brings us here to today. And uh, the goals that I'm going to be highlighting here and the objectives that I'm going to be highlighting here really uh, are those that we, we felt informed the elaboration of this survey. It was, it was helpful in the network to start out with the specific questions and topics because it's, it's oftentimes a lot easier to get input on what data points uh, practitioners in the field would need. But our hope is that from today's meeting and input on these goals and benchmarks, we can, uh, goals and objectives, we can see if there's anything that we missed from a strategic perspective before we finalize the survey. So why benchmarking? Well, the initial pain point, if we can call it that, that came out of the network was to see if the targets that we're setting are ambitious and realistic. Um, uh, this this actually is, is one of the reasons why uh, uh, Ian McDermott is presenting today. I mean, he, he'll, he'll share his experience from 
uh, Birmingham where they developed targets and then they had no peers to compare against to see if what they were saying was was really ambitious uh, was it really realistic uh, there's other cities that have uh, very different targets and and are those also realistic or are we setting ourselves up for uh, investing in tree planting and not caring for existing trees as Naomi said because our targets are not realistic and we're going to spend all of our money up front and and not be able to deliver however it's been difficult for for the cities in our network to find and engage with peer cities who have comparable urban forests it's a lot of work to reach out to find another city that's also looking to benchmark wants to put the time in to exchange wants to figure out how their data talks to your data because everybody measures urban forests in the same way but at the same time Small differences in definitions can, can, can really mean data is not comparable. Uh, and, and there's always the local nuances that, that are measured differently. Uh, and then, uh, so we'll hear about some, some examples today, such as different ways to measure canopy cover and how this can really uh, affect whether you think you're doing well or not on, on your urban forestry targets. So clearly there's a need uh, that's being expressed by our network. Now, just some examples. These are some of the cities in, in, in the Trees and Cities Challenge. Um, how do we compare Nice in France with uh, Pretoria in South Africa? They have different planting targets here. You can see by orders of magnitude. Um, they have different ways of measuring their own targets, even at the high level, in terms of what they're pledging in the Trees and Cities Challenge. Um, can we come up with benchmarks that are going to be useful in both cities. I think this is an interesting challenge because in their local context, both of these are cities that are really um, committed to urban forestry as a nature-based solution. Some other examples kind of really to highlight how this is challenging, let's take it closer to home to Geneva and Lausanne, uh, two cities just across the lake from each other in Switzerland, um, right, right next, well, right where we are and right next door to us here at, at UNECE. Um, more modest tree planting targets, but that depends also on uh, what, how, how you think about it. You can see how urbanized in, uh, they are and how, how little space there is for, for tree planting in the, the urban centers. Um, th they both have similar canopy cover targets, um, but they also have some really interesting targets like Geneva abandoning pruning of 900 architectural trees to have more biomass in the canopy and provide more space for species. Um, one thing that I found striking is when I looked at uh, the OECD, which has its data set on canopy cover in cities, it didn't match what Geneva and Lausanne are telling me. And, and it has a breakdown by urban and rural and it, it also didn't match. So there's clearly a lot of work to be done. So in terms of the goals for benchmarking, what we did is we defined a theory of change. So we see the outcome, the target outcome, is that uh, as nature-based solutions and critical green infrastructure uh, that provides uh, important resilience and other ecosystem services, urban and peri-urban forests are sustainably managed and expanded over time to maximize the contribution of their benefits and services to local, national, and global goals. And this is something that uh, we are convinced of, and, and if, if you'd like to learn more about why, why we see this as something that's quite a, a reasonable outcome to expect from urban and peri-urban forestry, I would encourage you to read our policy brief, uh, which was launched earlier this year, and our regional opportunities plan, which highlights actions that can be taken at the city level, the national level, and even our regional, UNECE regional level, and is currently uh, uh, in consultation uh, with our intergovernmental committees uh, as, as uh, two documents that can provide some more background for you. Now taking this target outcome, what do we need to achieve it? Oops, excuse me, I, I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Just uh, one more thing to highlight here. Uh, in addition to the documents that I highlighted, this is something that is already in the intergovernmental uh, apparatus, if I can call it that way. Each year, UNECE has a regional forum for sustainable development for our, all the, the member countries in our region, which stretches from US, Canada to Vladivostok, as, as we say, in uh, 
includes 56 member states. Reporting to, to New York for the High Level Political Forum, which is the annual review of the SDGs, highlighted urban forestry as, as a critical uh, and cost-effective nature-based solution. And that there's a lot of work left to be done to align policy actions across different sectors, levels of government, um, to increase support from national government to city level action, um, to promote integrated long term planning and management, as we heard from Liliana, um, and to make sure that urban forests are accessible to all. So, coming to my point, how do we achieve this? To deliver this outcome and maximize the potential benefits, uh, we need to ensure that urban forests have the right tree, the right place, for the right reason, and that they survive and thrive over time. Some of the key components to make sure this happens is integrated long-term planning, sustainable management over time, which is supported by adequate and predictable resources. It has to have enabling supporting policy and government structures, uh, we can come back to the, the overlapping mandates or unclear mandates on urban forestry maybe later in our discussion today, and uh, sustained political support and capacity building. So when we translate this to thinking about goals for benchmarking, we are using these same five categories. Benchmark should help policymakers and planners set ambitious yet realistic urban forestry targets. We want our urban forests to survive and thrive uh, and expand over time while consistently delivering our desired benefits and services through long-term management. We need to make sure that planners and decision makers can target and allocate the resources that are available efficiently and mobilize new resources when needed. And we need to make sure that we have coherent policy in support of urban forestry across sectors and levels of government. Finally, political commitments that are clear and measurable over time are, are one of the key ways to hold our, 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 our leaders to account. Uh, and this is where I think uh, the Trees and Cities Challenge does have the, the tree planting targets because it's a high level political commitment. So, when we think about each of these benchmarking objectives, uh, uh, goals, uh, like integrated long term planning, we can then flesh out some specific objectives that should be dis, uh, covered by our, our benchmarking survey. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll share this one as an example now, but my plan is actually to, after the slide, go to our presentations uh, from our three experts, and then to come back to these slides for the final discussion. Because I think our case studies today will really inform any input you may have on uh, our objectives. Uh, this is also something that you'll have a chance to provide input on uh, when we ask for your input on our survey. We have a document that outlines these objectives and why they are relevant for each of these goals for our survey. And so you'll have opportunities to comment on them as well. For integrated long-term planning, as, as, as the example before we move on to the presentation uh, from uh, Ms. Brooks Stark, is that... Uh, one, the first thing we heard about is that uh, if we want integrated long-term planning, we need to facilitate comparability among urban areas so that uh, different planners uh, can compare against each other when they're developing their plans. We need to, of course, make sure the information is relevant for long-term planning, such as what would be used in master planning, urban forestry master planning. Uh, we need to maximize compatibility with data from urban forestry inventories while recognizing that these inventories are often more detailed and, and tailored to local context so that we know we're not replicating in inventories, we're just pulling from the most important and strategic elements. We should include information on change in urban forest cover over time so that we can uh, see how, how we expect our urban forests to evolve and be able to measure our planning targets uh, as we get into management. We should include information on available resources in the cities we're benchmarking against so that we can think if we're comparing our targets with their targets, can we also compare our resources with their resources? Uh, if we have different resources, we, we may have to adjust our targets. 
We should include information on stakeholder engagement, including community engagement. Liliana talked about how important it is uh, in urban forestry in particular, given the, the large number of owners and in, in many countries in our region, the fact that most of the owners are, the trees are on privately owned land. And uh, we need to complement existing capacity building and advisory services that may be in place to support urban forestry planning. So I see Naomi dropping in the chat some, some ideas. So that's excellent. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, right now, before we move on to the presentation from uh, Ms. Brooks Stark, uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions on m my presentation. I prefer not to get into comments on this last slide here and keep that for the moderated discussion at the end of today's meeting if that's that's possible. But if there are any questions on my slide up to here on my presentation up to here, I'd be uh, wel I'd welcome them now. So please go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to come in. Yes, thanks, Daniel. Uh, a really great summary, but since I'm an urban forester and I am working at trying to improve the access here in Switzerland to best management practices, what you see clearly is that education is really missing. It, it, it's, it's not just professional. It begins with early childhood and, and exposing um, from, from youth to experiential education, which sensitizes the, the adult to be to what it means to coexist with nature, supporting nature-based solutions, and also what's severely lacking. And I would say as a general comment about Europe is uh, uh, an acceptance of the profession of urban forester or equivalent where how we address professionally the challenges that are faced in the urban forest are, are provided and, and the training enables you to go out there and actually manage the resource and plan for dealing with the challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi. Now, this is this is a great comment, um, and uh, it's it's definitely something that is I think reflected in the the survey that you had had looked at earlier this year, where we're looking um, at at staff. I I don't rem I ca I'd have to go back and check if we have one on training. So that's that's a great comment there. Um, I do think um, that in terms of our objectives, that's something that we can we can put into here. But I I would limited to maybe assessing training among the existing staff capacity, um, just to keep it within the scope of, of benchmarking, um, and which raises a, a question that I think we'll come back to today, which is how much detail do we want? I mean, this, this is something that's, that's quite useful for policymakers if they're developing a policy on updating uh, curriculums or, or developing dedicated curriculums on urban forestry or specific dimensions of urban forestry. But it also increases the length of the survey and the reporting burden for cities. So our current approach is to have a, a standard version of the survey and a detailed version of the survey. But I, I think this is also something that uh, is important to keep in mind uh, as we're, we're finalizing our objectives. Um, so I think with this, I don't see any other requests. Um, I would like to move on to our next presenter. Um, and then come back to the benchmarking objectives in our discussion at the end of today's meeting. So I will uh, click through the next slides and come back to them later. So without further ado, I am uh, very honored to welcome Ms. Brooke Stark. Uh, Brooke is manager of the park, Parks Planning and Urban Forestry for the city of Victoria, British Columbia. Um, we know, I, 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 I won't spoil your presentation, Brooke, but I know that uh, you've done lots of great work on, on citizen engagement, which really links into one of the last points I mentioned. But 
Um, there's, there's, I, I really enjoyed our, our prep conversations for this, um, and I'm looking forward to your presentation today. So, Brooke, please, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and good morning, afternoon, evening to everybody. I just want to check before I get started. Ah, I see. Okay, how to advance slides. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, the city of Victoria is located on the homelands of the Songhees and Esquimalt people. So first, and most importantly, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am joining you from the homelands of the the Songhees and Esquimalt nations are descendants of the Lekwungen family group who hunted and gathered here from time immemorial and were here long before European settlement. I'm very pleased to be here today representing the city of Victoria and participating in this important virtual event with the informal network to discuss benchmarking for evidence-based urban forest policy and planning. As Daniel said, I'm Brooke Stark and I'm the manager of park planning and urban forestry with the city of Victoria. During my brief, brief presentation, I first wanted to provide a very brief overview of the city to give context and to add to our discussion during the session. The city of Victoria was incorporated in August 1862 and serves as the metropolitan core for the greater Victoria region. It is the capital city of British Columbia and welcomes nearly 4 million visitors each year. The city of Victoria is located on the southern tip of Vancouver Island on the west coast of British Columbia in Canada. We are, geographically speaking, a very small city with an area of just under 20 square kilometers and a population of 94,000, mostly urban and urban residential. The size and growth of our big, big little city is something I'll dig into in a few moments. However, a bit more for context setting, the Victoria region is much larger, comprised of 13 municipalities or local governments, with a combined population of nearly 400,000 in an area of close to 700 square, square kilometres. The city is just under 20 square kilometres. Most areas in Greater Victoria are within 30 minutes by car, transit or bicycle, courtesy of a growing network of bike and dedicated bus lanes, making it easy to get around or live a car light lifestyle. We are a coastal city with a temperate sub-Mediterranean climate. However, over the past few years, Victoria too has been experiencing the effects of climate change. Last year, in 2021, we experienced record-shattering temperatures and the hottest days ever as a region. And this year was not much different. Victoria, like many other cities, are now experiencing severe summer drought conditions as our new normal. But these sustained summer droughts year upon year are anything but normal for our climate. Victoria is also home to the Gary Oak ecosystem. Gary Oaks and their associated ecosystems are among the most endangered in Canada. More than 100 species of plants and animals are officially listed as at risk in these ecosystems. It is estimated that the city has approximately 150,000 trees in its urban forest, growing on both private and public lands. We have taken inventory and manage a tree database, so we know that 33,000 of these trees are growing on public property or on city land, in parks, greens, on city boulevards, these trees are cared for by a small, dedicated team of arborists, groundspeople and support staff and are protected and well cared for. And through our tree protection bylaw, all the trees on private land are protected too. This protection balances land use and land development rights for property owners with tree protection. The bylaw is administered by the city with a small group of arborists who work tirelessly with landowners, developers and other city staff in protecting existing trees through development whenever possible. And also protecting future trees, soil volumes and placement of these trees so these replacement trees will thrive and grow to maturity. The Victoria region is growing fast. The region's population grew by 6.2% between 2016 and 2020, attracting new residents from across Canada and internationally, and putting additional development pressure on an already limited, built-out land base. Housing is one of the greatest pressing challenges facing Victoria. Rental vacancy rates are 1%, and in 2020 there were 1,500 people experiencing homelessness in our city. 69% of our citizens believe housing is the most important issue we are facing as a city. And add to that, 
Over the next 20 years, the number of citizens in the city of Victoria is expected to grow considerably. Modest projections forecast population growth of upwards of 20,000 people, or 111,000 by 2041. Translating to the need for approximately 11,000 new households in an already built out city with no greenfield development opportunities. To accommodate this growth, the city is reviewing its housing policies and considering the required and projected changes in our housing stock. This means changing the traditional use from single family dwellings with relatively large gardens and yards and trees in urban residential areas into apartments, townhouses, row houses, and multi-suite homes, which of course will impact our trees, our canopy cover, and our urban forest as we know it. Between our unprecedented growth, the changing climate and our limited land base, our urban forest is critically important to consider through land use policy. What's an appropriate level of protection and balance and how do we build much needed housing for people while creating livable, biodiverse and healthy cities? How do we create housing today and plan for a future where healthy communities thrive? Luckily, I, as the manager of park planning and urban forestry, I'm not the only person advocating for trees and the sustainable management of our living assets. The mayor, city council and senior leadership are all committed to advancing the goals outlined in our urban forest master plan. In 2019, resources were significantly increased to help protect and enhance the urban forest. I work with a diverse, talented and very knowledgeable team across the city who are also committed to the sustainable management of urban trees, including my colleagues in development services and community planning, engineering and not just in parks and urban forestry. We work very hard and collaborate to understand our competing priorities, our common goals, our opportunities, and through this work on a large number of really neat initiatives. Over the past couple of years, I've witnessed the attitude shift to valuing green infrastructure as much as gray infrastructure as we collaborate, knowledge share and problem solve, and we work together on projects. Urban forestry staff work closely with transportation planners, stormwater management planners and community planners to incorporate tree protection into our projects and to find opportunities to expand tree canopy across the city. Our public works crews are calling on us when water mains fail to ensure tree removals are a last resort and trees are protected through necessary grey infrastructure repairs. Genuine collaboration has been key for us to move the dial on sustainable tree management. And through these collaborative efforts, new research shows that Victoria's urban forest grew between 2013 and 2019. Analysis of LIDAR data shows vegetation canopy in our region increased by 45 hectares. This is because of the strong policies and programs developed to strengthen the urban forest now and into the future. And with the projected growth of population and required housing, and as I've already mentioned, our city having no greenfield development opportunities, how we protect and manage our urban forest is critically important so we continue to realize tree canopy cover growth. Benchmark benchmarking with other cities of similar geographical size and density is very important to help us realize opportunities so we can continually improve our policies, bylaws and planning work. Partnering to share information, successes and failures is key. For example, what are other cities doing to protect the long-term vitality of new trees planted, perhaps through development, along street edges? How are they working with utility companies such as hydro and gas companies to ensure the utilities and trees don't conflict over time? How are they ensuring there's adequate soil volumes? What are required soil volumes? How is this achieved? Soil cells, perhaps? While balancing stormwater, bike lanes, buses, pedestrians, what protection and policies are in place to enable the replacement tree being planted will grow and thrive to maturity and not require removal in 20 years due to underground parkade membrane repair? These are all quite specific questions that municipalities struggling with the same challenges may share. I feel so grateful that I work for and live in a municipality where the planners, engineers and urban foresters all want to and work to ensure that we're bu building a future city that is livable for people, that has shade, biodiversity and the many other benefits included with a diverse and healthy urban forest. It makes my job a lot easier. But for those municipalities that are struggling with other city departments, sharing ideas on what works and what doesn't and how the change has changed and how the change has transpired in our city may help. 
Our community is keenly aware of the value and importance of trees. Yet with the housing crisis, we have a lot of work to do to build momentum on tree protection and tree planting across private land to continue to grow our natural shade, our urban forest. The City of Victoria joined the Trees and Cities Challenge and kicked off 2020 with a pledge to plant 5,000 trees during the timeline of the campaign. To support residents in planting, we developed resources such as tree planting fact sheets, we hosted workshops and planting events, and developed incentives such as grants for neighbourhood plantings. In 2022, we continue to work with our residents towards this tree planting goal, with the right tree, for the right reasons, in the right place, under the right conditions, for long-term vitality, which is challenging in a small built-out city undergoing a housing crisis, but we are committed to this pledge. We are also committed to supporting residents with knowledge and expertise to manage the trees on private property, and we hope in future to provide grant opportunities to residents to assist with costs associated with maintaining trees. I'm very proud that in 2020, Victoria was recognized as a tree city of the world, and I'm grateful to be part of such a dynamic collaborative team. With this recognition, Victoria has been invited to share roundtable discussions with this informal network of experts on sustainable urban forestry, and with that, join discussions on the need and value of benchmarking to advance the sustainable management of urban forests for Victoria and around the globe. We are eager and we look forward to further opportunities to work with the network on this benchmarking work. Thank you. Brooke for that really excellent overview um, I enjoyed that a lot um, really got a sense for Victoria as a city as well um, and, and it's it's amazing to see uh, the resources and support that you you have had um, I mean I think this recognition is very well well warranted um, but I also wanted to thank you for the questions that you raised I mean I think this is really the challenge that we're, we're up against today um, you have all these questions, other cities have all these questions, you're, you're really a leader in many senses. How can you find the right city to connect with? Uh, how can you compare yourself against them in a way uh, that's useful? This, this is a challenge. Um, some of the questions you raised, I think it's through peer-to-peer -peer exchange, uh, not necessarily through benchmarking. But if we don't have benchmarks, uh, then, then you can't find the right peers to even engage with in the first place. So. Um, Anyhow, I don't want to monopolize the discussion. Uh, please do raise your hand if you have questions for Brooke. I see a number in the chat as well, um, but uh, maybe I'll see if anyone wants to take the floor with any specific questions for Brooke. Maybe Brooke, I'll, I'll flag one for you. It's an interesting question from Naomi about whether any of your planning and management is driven by Canada's urban forest strategy. Thank you for the question, uh, Naomi. Our, our um, urban forest master plan was developed in 2012 and adopted by council in 2013 and was based on the time at uh, quite a lot of technical research and comparison with municipalities in British Columbia and on Vancouver Island. Um, it wasn't strongly driven, no, by Canada's urban forest strategy. Um, however, uh, our master plan does require updating as does our parks and open spaces master plan um, and we'll look look to federal alignment thank you thank you very much Brooke um, and I, I do think it's an interesting question as we're thinking about how can benchmark support that alignment with federal policy um, and not just alignment on uh, your urban forestry master planning but on, on support coming from the the national to the local level Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, we will have more chances to come back to some of these examples, I think, in our discussion later on. Uh, right now, I'm pleased to welcome our next presenter to the floor, uh, Mr. Ian McDermott. Uh, he's speaking today uh, based on his experiences with Birmingham Tree People, which he helped to co-found. Uh, but uh, uh, Ian is also the former executive director of, Inter of the International Society of Arboriculture 
in the UK and Ireland chapter. He's also the former chairman of the Municipal Trees, uh, Tree Officers Association in the UK and has worked extensively as a consultant, lecturer, and, and trainer. So he brings a wealth of knowledge today. Uh, we're really lucky to have you with us today, uh, uh, Mac, if I may. And uh, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. I appreciate it. And thank you very much to everybody here for giving me uh, your attention. Um, I'll try and stick to my time if it's possible. Uh, I'm guessing that everybody can see and hear by the looks of it. So it's just a very brief introduction um, to what we're going to talk about for a few minutes today. Um, my thanks to my colleagues at Birmingham City Council and also at Treeconomics. Uh, I've used some of their slides and some of their information. So Simon at the City was our client uh, when we were developing this master plan. And then Kenton was our contractor. And I represent the Birmingham Tree people who were the agent that delivered all of this. And we're going to have a little look at the brief journey so far um, towards developing the master plan, the key performance indicators, which comes up several times today, and then a continuing journey beyond next spring, when hopefully we'll have a meaningful benchmarking with a, a sister city. So this is just a comparison of the KPIs and our journey towards the report card. Can I advance the slides myself or do I shout out? I guess I... Uh, Oh, excellent. Thank you. That's great. So hopefully you can see uh, the next slide. So this is a front page of our um, master plan, which is where our journey restarted. So this is kind of our new starting point. This, this has 37 KPIs, key performance indicators in. We went down this route as a measurable metrics. Um, we didn't want to follow what have gone on before within the UK. We were the first city in Birmingham to adopt the master planning process where we can actually measure how we're doing on a year-to-year -year basis to compare our performances. It is difficult to hold up as a, th as a third sector, we call third sector, we're a charity, um, so we're members of the public, to hold the city up to scrutiny uh, against its, its policies and its KPIs. Uh, so we're looking for measurable performance. And of course, we've been in looking and now we're out looking. So we have a set of KPIs, 37 all in told. And then we started to say, right, once we've got this journey underway, do they actually make any sense? Um, do these mean anything to anybody other than us? Can we compare ourselves to other cities? And we'll look at some examples that we looked at as we go through. We're lucky in the UK in the fact that we have some accepted wisdom. So we have a lot of publications in the UK around urban forestry. This is just one example. Um, this is for the TDAG, Trees and Design Action Group. They had this around for quite a few years. Um, so we just have highlighted, I don't know, my pointer doesn't seem to work, but um, we highlighted those on the left in the planning section. So we need to know our tree resource. And in Birmingham, which is the UK's, well, England's second city, smack in the middle of England, 1.1 million people um, currently, a very young population. We have five universities based within the city. So there are some, some demographics that influence what we do and how we do it. Um, so we, we have this where we know our resource. We do know our street tree resource quite well. We know nothing about our private sector trees and a little bit about our parks and housing. Um, so we felt that knowing the tree resource was going to be uh, one of the hindrances to moving forward. We then had to have a comprehensive tree strategy, which is what it used to be called. Uh, we've called ours a master plan, but it's just what's in a name. And then we wanted to make sure that we embed trees into our planning policies and other plans. And we'll mention that a little bit as we go on. We have some other accepted wisdom metrics, such as the 10, 20, 30, which some of you all know. And also, obviously, the 33300, which I'll note again a bit later on in this, in this session. Um, so we said we consider these as accepted wisdoms within our urban forestry and arboricultural uh, industry. And then we also obviously kicked off our kickoff point was uh, the Jim Clark um, paper from the 90s, um, Sustainable Urban Forestry and the Metrics to Measure Them. So these are just introductory slides. Um, sadly, the um, transitions aren't working. So this slide looks a bit of a mess. Um, I can't do the, tr the, the transitions have not loaded. 
so what this is was a, a, a little bit about we took a bit of a view of what else is going on within the UK so at the back there we have the Confederation of Forest Industries which have some guidelines on target planting you can't see the visual on this one but it's all about numbers you've heard a lot today from the speakers and from Daniel about numbers numbers games this tree that tree a couple of million here a couple of million there um, and obviously from a forestry federation you would expect that to be a metric that that would uh, at attract their attention but we tend to be dealing with urban forests and obviously the forestry doesn't really apply we don't have that many mass plantings within Birmingham we have pretty much planted all of our small trees close together sites so our woodlands there aren't many going in there we have moved away from the numbers and are now moving towards sustained planting how many trees did we establish is the question in our metrics not how many we planted. The next one in the middle is Solihull, which is a neighbouring authority. Their tree strategy in 2019 had no measurable outcomes whatsoever. And we were keen that we went in a different direction. And then the, the definition of madness was to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So Gloucestershire decided that um, 35, sorry, 3.5 million trees wasn't enough. So they wanted to plant 35 million trees Obviously that's over 10,000 trees a day over the 10 years of the life of the plan. Impossible task. And they realised after two years they'd only planted two days worth of trees. And this, this thing about the political headline of must plant, must plant, um, we absolutely didn't go in that direction at all. Uh, so we didn't want it to be defined as madness. So we've gone slightly different direction. So our benchmarking. Sorry, I'm just catching my slides up. So um, we already have a number of sister cities and twins. So Lyon, Frankfurt, Leipzig, Milan are our twin cities within the city's governance net network. And we have sister cities with Chicago, Guangzhou and Johannesburg. Um, none of these bore any great fruit. So some good examples, Chicago is 10 times the size of us. And on the right hand side of the screen, we have Abbotsford, which are part of the UNC, UNECE group, uh, which are one-tenth of the size of us. So we have that issue about resources. Um, so we've got language barriers. We've got a whole pile of um, ecological barriers and, and geographical barriers. And we couldn't find a city where um, meaningful metrics made any sense at all. So I'll come on to Belfast in a moment. Um, which is the area that we'll be looking to benchmark in the future. And there's a pretty good reason for that one, which I'll come to in a second. In order that we made sure that our metrics were um, made sense to the people who live in the city, we had a fairly extensive outreach campaign. And the slides you can see is our steering group on a Zoom meeting. This all occurred during lockdown. Um, we have a steering committee that then engaged on three or four major um, extensive public meetings, again all online. And there are people on here that are representatives from regional groups around Birmingham. Uh, you can see Kenton and here and also some, uh, Cecil and one or two other people who were party to developing our, net, uh, our KPIs. And then we obviously we re developed the plan in accordance with the views of the public who were put in, putting into it. Just to give a mention to this, this document, we have a lot of publicity for our master plan. But one of the things that we were very keen to do, we have a policy review. So this is an example of just one of our KPIs, in this case T1, canopy cover, and we'll come to canopy cover a few times. So we have, what well, we reviewed, and again, Cecil did most of this work for us. We've gone international, European, national, and local level where Policies across the world are tied into our objectives for relative canopy cover. So we have the planning background. So all of our objectives sit within a policy review framework. And again, this is fairly fluid uh, for obvious reasons in the city of Birmingham. Um, there are lots of new objectives and lots of new plans coming along. Our route to zero, uh, which has recently been adopted by the city, has a lot of green outcomes in it and we need to make sure that our policy review and our plan is quite fluid 
in order that it can reflect the, the um, upcoming ambitions of the city. So this is just a picture of a new development down by the universities. So a stated vision from our plan was so having more trees for Birmingham. I've paraphrased it. This is our stated vision. And I'll just draw your attention to the simple act of planting a tree, which some of you will recognise as a publication from the 1990 from the LA tree people. The Birmingham tree people had kind of adopted their model, used them as our parent group. And this is one of those great, great titles for a 500 page book of which you can still download for free. And uh, Daniel's got all the links for these. The simple act of planting a tree couldn't be any more difficult when it comes to the urban environment. There's a huge amount to consider. We don't, um, we don't do the right tree, right place thing. We do right reason, right tree, right place, and then the right way. We added a fourth metric onto the end in order that we can actually plant the trees in the right way to meet the other objectives. And that has come from the uh, that vision that we had from Andy Lipkis a long time ago in the simple act of planting a tree. If you haven't got the book, I think it's an absolute essential. And just to drill down on that simple act, uh, some of you may have seen this slide, I've used this before. Um, there's a reference for it. Um, the magic number is how many trees we've got to plant each year. That magic number. And then we have the um, the other bit of the formula that goes on. So the number of trees that are actually removed is the R. And then we have to vacant pits the length of the goal by what we're planting divided by that really tough question, assumed planting survival. In the authority I'm sitting in at the moment where I live, they can kill trees in a ph phenomenal rate. We appear to be losing more trees, even though they're planting thousands every year. There's a negative loss. The, uh, the carbon uh, impact on that is, is just truly mind-blowing. So, the common language. One of the things about what we were trying to achieve from our... Um, our metrics was making sure we asked the right question to the right place that meant the right thing to everybody. So here's an example from the three metrics we've picked today. Tree planting, right tree, right place. And we've just gone, why are you planting it? We've got the numbers game, which is what many people are doing. And we're talking about establishment. Canopy cover is the one we're going to look at, drill up down a little bit more in a moment. Tree versus non-tree is pretty much how most of the canopy cover studies are done. Do they count hedges? Do they count small trees? Are the resolution enough? Whereas what we have done, we've in our canopy cover, which we'll look at in a moment, we've removed amenity areas, we've removed blue infrastructure, we've removed grey infrastructure, and equity I'll mention in a moment. This is a screenshot from our plan, and I apologise, it's a bit grainy. Uh, so we've got R3 and R4 we were looking at, and this is the Birmingham plan. This is a summary sheet. Each of these metrics, R1 to R18, has a page developed, dedicated to itself which expands it more and explains it more. So we considered that our canopy cover we were performing poorly at a low performance level, which meant that we gave it a higher priority. And then we've got another one at the bottom which I'll look at in a moment with native vegetation. We felt we were doing rather well with native vegetation, so as a consequence it was given a low priority. And then to compare that with Belfast, so what happened we were contracted, Tree Economics won the contract to develop the comprehensive tree strategy for Belfast, which as you know is Northern Ireland. Um, so it's part of the UK, but across the water. Um, and obviously we were then contracted as Birmingham tree people to help with the community engagement side and work on the technical aspects of these things. So here you can see their, their R3 and R4, they've considered they've got a moderate performance and then obviously that then goes down to a medium priority. But the interesting one I've drawn out was the native vegetation. They've given themselves a good score, but a high priority. And that reflects the number of people that were involved in the, in the engagement. They did an absolutely phenomenal job of public engagement. Um, they had the biggest response to public engagement the city's ever had. And we can certainly learn a lesson from them. You can't read this because I can't zoom in and out. Left-hand um, diagram, 91% of people uh, inter interviewed responded positively to the need for a tree strategy. And then we had 80-odd percent um, that we were asking about the 330-300 metrics. 
and this is 80 odd percent can see a tree from their window and most of the trees that we can see on that pink bar are in a neighbour's property. So we did quite a bit of detail with the, um, with the survey on this one in order to inform the Belfast strategy and obviously from that um, we are able to then oddly enough compare our metrics very much like for like they have an identical set of metrics for Belfast so maybe in the spring we'll be having exchange visits to do much more detailed work just to drill down a little bit further in the uh, T3 uh, which is the canopy cover stuff on the left hand side is our national tree database uh, map so that's Birmingham on the right hand side match you could match the shape up so I've drawn out Bordesley and Highgate at 9.6% canopy cover which is what the Forestry Commission tell us it is. It's slightly different on the National Tree Data Map and then of course when we did our own um, we have this issue that we have we found out we had four canopy studies every one of them gave us a different score so we consider our performance on canopy measurement was low our priority therefore was high to get it right and we gave ourselves an April of uh, this year uh, response rate so what we did as Birmingham tree people was bought some software that we can actually do it accurately so we removed those metrics as we said no grey no blue and no sports services no motorways etc etc and as you can see Bornsley and Highgate doubled its canopy cover so if we'd have gone with the national metrics and gone out we're way below what we're expecting it should be uh, we've managed to double the canopy cover by measuring it accurately and that's the message for the day from my take home really is that we need to get rid of the fuzzy metrics the ones that don't make a great deal of sense when you look at them closely um, so what we've been saying is that we need to be accurate about what we're measuring and accurate about what we're comparing um, we have a national requirement of guideline from the government of 20 percent canopy cover for our cities and Birmingham went from 18 percent to 21 percent by just changing the way we measure it so we have no real canopy ambitions anymore except obviously for that middle bit those light yellow coloured areas which have very low canopy cover those will be our target wards I just want to drop this quick slide in I think I'm running out of time so I get a bit of a move on about uh, cultural values and equity environmental justice it's called quite a few things become a big international buzzword um, we are currently uh, working with the Woodland Trust and the government to develop an equity score for the UK along the lines of the um, American Forest, the AMFOR guidelines. So we've already got ways that we can measure these metrics now uh, in order to get out. Again, I've lost my transition, so I'll excuse this slide. This is just our software and it shows how we can count our trees, our tree species, our genus, our family, how we measure our metrics for the urban forest, how we overlay the indices of multiple deprivation which is that top slide and the last one before we finish is just that little bit about the report cards and where we are with this so we're developing a report card that we can actually measure the metrics with us Birmingham and with Belfast who are using the same KPIs so as we've, we've given an example today of two or three KPIs gone very very quickly through the detail and how difficult it is to have those accurate detail and we've only got 34 more to do to develop our report cards so we can compare this like for like and then hopefully we'll have something we can use in the future to report back on an annual review of our performance metrics so it's a work in progress we'll have to perhaps have some more news in the summer when we've done our first um, exchange visit and hopefully I've um, got through in the right amount of time, have a Daniel? Mac, yes, no, that was very uh, insightful and, and I think uh, we're right on time. Um, before I editorialize too much, does anyone want to come in? Um, please let, raise your hand if you have questions on the presentation. Um, while you're thinking about that, I just wanted to highlight, I, I think your point on the change in canopy cover from 9.6% to 19% just based on change in the definition really gets at the importance of the benchmarking exercise that we're working on because 
uh, one thing I, I, I noticed you mentioned is, I mean, initially your urban forestry master plan had a, fo a much stronger focus on canopy cover, which now as Birmingham tree people, you you don't think is as uh, as important. Not that it's not important, but it's not, it's less of a priority now because you're not doing as, you're not in as bad a position as maybe the initial metrics suggested. So uh, this really influences all the resource allocation, this one metric, and, and getting the definition right is really critical if we want to be spending our existing resources efficiently, uh, let alone uh, fundraising more resources, I think. The other thing I did want to highlight uh, as, as one of my takeaways is you, you mentioned 80% support, uh, sorry, 80% of citizens in Belfast can see a tree from their home. And I think it's great to see the, the 330-300 metric being, being included in the survey. In this case, the number of trees you can see from your window, the three. Um, but this is a huge resource implication for cities as well. Uh, it's a massive survey, like you said, the highest response rate for Belfast for anything. So, I mean, uh, this is the other challenge we're, we're, we're balancing and benchmarking. The, there's a cost to getting a lot more depth. Uh, you need a lot of resources on planning and um, cities that are just starting out may not have those. So how can we find metrics that are comparable across cities that are at different stages in capacity, I think is, is a big question uh, that we've tried to address, but uh, basically by having a standard version of the survey and a more detailed when, when cities have that information. Um, there's been a number of comments in the chat, um, but uh, I think um, their general comments at this point. So we'll come back to them in the next, uh, in, the, in the moderated discussion. So thank you so much, Mac. This is really a, a masterclass and um, I really appreciate that. Um, so without further ado, I would like to now invite Ms. Yvonne Lynch to the floor for her presentation. Uh, Yvonne is an urban forestry expert uh, who's worked in, with cities across the world. Um, she, uh, at one point was leading efforts in Melbourne, Australia, um, and then supported uh, developing urban forestry targets for cities around Australia, um, uh, in addition to her uh, subsequent consulting work globally. Uh, more recently, she collaborated to lead the, the strategic development of Green Riyadh, uh, uh, sorry, a $10 billion program to green Saudi, the, the capital city of Saudi Arabia, um, which is uh, a challenging context for 330-300 while we're on that topic. Um, but, uh, and Yvonne now is uh, consulting independently on a range of projects. So Yvonne, thank you so much and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, okay, so um, as Daniel has mentioned, um, I've spent time in both uh, Australia and Saudi Arabia, and um, mainly I'll be focusing um, my talk around uh, work in these two countries. Um, I guess when I think about benchmarking and what uh, indicators we're most often using, um, obviously, we're looking at tree counts um, and number commitments for tree programs, um, which is a, a very big one lately. Canopy cover, uh, tree species, genus and family diversity, green space per capita, and uh, distance to travel to get to green space. Um, but there's a range of um, indicators, I guess, that have a lesser focus and, and sometimes I think are probably more important than what we generally tend to focus on. So, for example, citizen participation, trees lost due to development, trees actually successfully protected from development, uh, tree mortality and survival rates um, as associated with tree planting programs funding and the resources that are needed for the type of work that we're doing when we're launching these strategies with, you know, 10, 20, 30 year implementation timeframes. And then, of course, um, always left out is funding that's very specific to operations and maintenance. It's uh, it's the the favorite one to overlook from my perspective. So I'll start in Melbourne. Um, as many of you know, Melbourne's one of the world's most livable city. It has a, a fascinating green heritage, 
but in 2010 we found ourselves at a critical point um, so we went and did a, a health assessment of the city's trees so there's 70,000 polygons there on the map all bleeding into each other and what we found when we undertook um, a useful life expectancy health assessment was that we were set to lose most of the city's trees. So uh, in 2010, what the data was indicating was that we were likely to suffer a loss of 20% of the tree population over 10 years and 44% of the, um, the tree population over two decades. And that's absolutely astounding. I mean, I think for anybody who's a, a city practitioner as I was at the time, to have to uh, make this type of announcement to your community is quite a daunting one, uh, never mind to the, to the politicians. And so um, the reason for that was largely due to um, the millennium drought that Mel Melbourne suffered for about 13 years prior. And what happened was obviously there was less uh, rainfall, but also we had water conservation targets, which meant that we turned off the taps on the urban landscapes. And so obviously we, we set about trying to um, put in place a robust urban forest strategy that could guide the city through uh, the coming decades. And when we went to benchmark, um, the city that we really looked to as a reference point was Singapore. And obviously not for climatic similarities or anything like that, but more because Singapore we had recognized as an established leader in urban forestry for many decades. And we really liked the vision that they had put in place to become a city within a park and how they really stuck to implementing that. And so um, we copied somewhat their, um, their vision and uh, we put in our own vision to become a, a city within a forest. Um, we went and looked at, I guess, a range of factors. Um, this uh, map was produced actually by one of my former colleagues who I think is online, Cinnamon Dobbs. And this was just looking at Melbourne's uh, NDVI to look at the vegetation index. And what we found was that as Melbourne had developed over two decades, you can see 1988 there, um, the canopy car or the green cover, sorry, was about 24.6%. But as the city went to develop um, in two decades, it actually almost halved its green cover. And when we looked to Singapore, um, we actually found a different story. Their, their canopy cover or their green cover was about 35.7% in 1986, and they experienced hyperdevelopment, yet they managed to significantly increase their green cover whilst undergoing that development. And that was significant for us at the time because Melbourne was and still is Australia's fastest growing city. And certainly we were recognizing the pressures um, put on the urban forest from development. So one of the goals we put in place was to increase the canopy cover, um, to bring it from 22% in 2010, right up to 40%, actually in, in 2040, not 2030. So um, pretty uh, bold, pretty ambitious, uh, perhaps looking at that now, I would say too ambitious, um, not realistic in terms of what could be achieved in two decades, uh, particularly contending with the circumstance of, of losing almost 44% of uh, the city's tree population in the same time frame. Um, so we weren't focused just on numbers. Uh, we didn't make big announcements about how many trees we were going to plant each year. Uh, what we were really focusing on was how do we actually grow the canopy in the best possible manner. And so you can see here on the screen, this is just a, an average tree. So we'd gone around, we'd mapped our tree planting opportunities. And you can see here um, the, the, the green circles on, on Benjamin Street. We identified that if we went into that street and planted as usual, and we wanted to increase um, the canopy cover, with our current methods, we would put in about 26 trees and we might um, achieve a canopy cover of 30% in that street. But actually, if we started to think about it differently and, and thought about the position of the trees, maybe moving them out of a narrow footpath into the 
the road space, controversially losing one or two parking spaces, and actually giving them more room to grow. What we calculated was that we could have 12 trees instead of 26 and achieve a 55% canopy cover. So this program wasn't about the numbers. It was more about changing the way we were doing uh, our business in terms of tree planting. And of course, obviously we did calculate because we had to budget how many trees did we need to plant each year to replace the loss and to grow the canopy. And we calculated that that was about 3,000 trees per year. And we outlined and published um, our planting plans. They were developed with the community, um, something like 20,000 uh, community members participating in that. And of course, we looked to planting and greening every opportunity area in the city, even the laneways. And we developed um, targets around open space. Uh, these were benchmarked more um, regionally in Australia rather than internationally. We set a goal of all residents being within 300 metres distance um, of a, a quality green space. And obviously to obtain new green space in a hyper-developing city where land prices are you know, astoundingly high, we did look to repurposing roads and underutilised spaces around the city. Um, we also put in place diversity targets for the trees. Uh, we did acknowledge, you know, the, the, the most used diversity target by uh, Santa Moore, um, which is the 10, 20, 30 rule. Uh, we thought we would go a little bit further than that and we put in place um, a 5, 10, 20 rule. Um, mainly that was due to acknowledging that we were already seeing climate change effects on Melbourne's trees and we were seeing a high risk that we wanted to manage. Therefore, diversifying the tree portfolio was um, critical. So then we got into implementation and it, it really became obvious the areas that we had not focused on and that we had missed in our strategy. And so the first was obviously planting. So um, we had, uh, you know, 3,000 trees we were planting each year. But year on year, 1,000 of those newly planted trees would fail. And so I asked the question, why? Um, nobody could actually give an answer. And what I found after a fairly intensive audit of the tree planting program was that actually the reason for um, the low or that the, the high level, a third of, of the trees being lost every year, was due to two key reasons. One was poor stock, which I, I will come to in a minute. And the other was actually, despite having well-trained crews, some of them weren't actually using proper planting techniques. We also found that awareness of our strategy and the, the goals and, and, and our uh, vision for the city was not really well understood with our people on the ground and our crews. So we took the time to work with them, to train them and to really make them part of the work and integrate them more fully as ambassadors of the urban forest. I think sometimes it is easy, and it was in our case, to forget the people on the ground who are actually doing all of the work, um, especially when you're, you're sitting in the office making the policy. Um, the stock, the tree stock was an issue for us. So um, what we were often seeing was root girdle stock, really poorly grown stock. And we really had to work with the nursery garden industry in Australia to do something about that. Because despite having um, you know, tree growing standards um, in Australia, what we found was most of the growers thought that they were too difficult and so they didn't apply them. And so we worked uh, closely. Uh, this is one of the, the nurseries we worked with, uh, speciality trees outside of Melbourne, probably one of the best growers at the time. We really showcased their nursery and uh, worked with them to um, highlight that work and spread that best practice amongst the other nurseries. Obviously, then we had a, an issue around um, acquiring new species of trees because we changed the palette. Uh, the industry was reluctant to grow trees that weren't easy to grow and that weren't usual for them. Uh, but we overcame that one by sharing our species list with literally every other city in Australia. And the demand for those trees has increased. 
Um, but obviously, one of the other areas that um, we hadn't put strategic targets against was development and tree loss due to development. We had a tree policy in place, but it became fairly obvious quickly when we were mapping the canopy year on year and not seeing increases that, you know, this was in large fact due to the, you know, urban development removing larger canopy trees. And so we really uh, worked to reinforce the policy and make it more robust and uh, put higher price tags for tree removals which served as a deterrent. You can see here in this instance, 13 million for four of those small plane trees. Um, that served as enough of a deterrent for that developer. And we launched a fund with the money that was gathered so that we could encourage the developers to do their own greening. But um, of course, um, we were getting a lot of attention from the work around Australia. So we worked with the other uh, local governments and agencies around Australia. We produced this How to Grow an Urban Forest guide. And, you know, um, in 2013, when we launched it, only only or five cities had um, urban forest strategies. And we thought it was quite successful by the end when 88 um, local governments and cities had urban forestry uh, strategies at the end. But actually, when we looked into it further, and despite all of the work that had been done, we were actually not seeing the results that we had anticipated. So despite planting 30,000 trees in Melbourne over a decade, the tree canopy cover had only increased by 1.3%, as I said, largely due to development. And despite the fact that 88 cities now had urban forestry um, strategies, actually most of them were fast losing canopy over the time frame in which those strategies were developed because the heavy focus was on planting new trees and not protecting uh, already existing trees. So this was a, a lesson for us to learn. Um, in 2018, I went to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia to take some of Melbourne's um, know-how um, for their urban greening program, which is one of the largest uh, integrated urban greening programs in the world. Uh, obviously, you know, developing a strategy there for urban greening, we looked at all of the usual things, canopy cover, diversity. Um, we mapped the city to understand the development and the loss that had occurred of their already existing greening. We undertook our benchmarking, um, and you can see there, I mean, Riyadh at the time in 2018 was 0.4% canopy cover. And you can see, like, it's pretty hard to set uh, a benchmark against any of these other cities or any city you could name to us, really. So what we looked at was where we did have good canopy cover in the city, one particular district. Um, we noted the canopy cover of 7%. We had uh, a large range of parks and um, a very good re water recycling system pla in place there. And that was a template that we pretty much used to guide our strategy because we didn't feel that the international examples were so useful to us. Uh, we did the same for vegetation cover um, per capita and you know we're, we were at the lower end of everything. So it was extremely hard. We had to do it in our own context. Even that meant asking questions like what is a tree? Because actually in Riyadh, what, what we would consider a tree uh, would be considered a shrub in another city. So uh, lots of, um, I'd say, moments where we didn't have so much guidance and, and had to, to look at, you know, the already existing context and, and to, to figure that out appropriately. Obviously, water availability was one of the critical elements. And so how we devised our canopy targets in the end uh, was based on the number of trees we thought we could plant based on the availability of water that we could recycle and reuse. And so that number that we came to for trees that could be planted uh, over the span of the program is 7.5 million trees. And as I said, very much calculated around uh, water availability. And then the canopy cover calculated off the back of that coming in around 7.5% as the target. Uh, also in Riyadh, we had to work with the nurseries um, to increase and improve the, the growing practices. 
Um, we developed a, a centre of excellence which will come online next year to, to um, facilitate research and best practice in growing. And um, you can see here, this is what we were starting off with, uh, literally not very much. Um, and obviously some great progress has been made by the city um, with implementation in the last couple of years to the point that most of the roads and, and some parts of the city are now unrecognizable. Um, and I guess if I leave you with final remarks, um, in terms of diversity and benchmarking, uh, there is a, a nice review produced by uh, Cinnamon Dobbs and David Kendall um, of 108 cities. And, and what they found is actually um, existing urban forests are much less diverse than, than the benchmarks that are proposed. And I think one of the things I've, I've reflected a lot on, especially from my time in Saudi Arabia, is that diversity and canopy cover targets, they need to be considered in context of the climate and in context of species distribution in, in climatic zones. I don't think we can copy paste, um, especially when we get into more extreme zones, whether that's extremely cold or extremely hot. Um, and uh, tree numbers, look, they're not bad. They do mobilize political action. But when they're combined with uh, short time frames, they do lead to negative outcomes um, and they really need the budgets to be set alongside them. Uh, tree loss to due to development needs more attention um, in benchmarking. Uh, we need to advance more on our technology and remote sensing for comparable data. And uh, the funding is something that's always not understood well and it's an area we need to focus a lot more on. So I will, I will leave it there. Thank you. To us here, so thank you so much for, for pulling that together. Um, I, I think uh, the Riyadh example in particular is one to break our heads against as we think about how to make sure our benchmarking survey can be used across different contexts. Um, also, I, I really appreciated the the dimensions that you brought in that could be added on uh, uh, not just what is lost to development but what is protected from development um, and um, ideas there on, on the quality of the stock is that the sort of thing that we could uh, also integrate somehow. So um, I saw a number of questions in the chat so um, let me see I, I don't know what the first one I saw was from uh, Mac I believe I don't know if you want to come in. I I don't see it anymore, but um, I made a note, so I'll <laughs> I'll share it with Yvonne anyway. Uh, which was about uh, a question for you, Yvonne, about how much pushback you get from highway engineers regarding building outs for planting and how you get around it. Let me uh, give you back the floor. He's now is working with engineers. Uh, how we got around it in Melbourne was that uh, we actually, uh, our city, our chief city engineer uh, retired um, around the same time that we uh, launched our urban forest strategy. Uh, so we tapped him on the shoulder and said, uh, would you like to come back on a well-paid consulting gig <laughs> and work for us? And so he worked on the implementation and the planting of most of the trees and overcame most of the engineering uh, issues that we had. Um, so we had things like, you know, trying to put in permeable paving. Um, you know, uh, they would say it can't work. He would work with them to get it to work. They would highlight uh, health or safety issues on roadways, we can't plant trees here. So we had an engineer who could communicate in engineering language to the other engineers. And that's how um, we essentially in, in Riyadh uh, or in Melbourne overcame the issue. Uh, in Riyadh, literally everyone I worked with was an engineer. And so it was largely about um, educating them um, around uh, the potential or, and, and the, the research on urban forestry and taking it one step at a time. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, Mac, was that, uh, I see you turned on your 
your camera did you want to come back in or okay okay and I see that uh, Naomi's comment was addressed in the chat um, so thank you so much Yvonne um, I'm looking forward to going back through my notes because there's some great ideas here um, with that uh, we have about 20 minutes left I do want to leave some time for for other feedback I mean we've gotten a lot of ideas from these case studies today um, so other feedback on the objectives that we've identified for the benchmarking survey so what I will do I'll jump back to those slides and then I'll open up the floor and I'll go through them one at a time so please feel free to come in with questions comments things that you think I guess the point here is less on a, a technical level providing inputs and more on a strategic level so Yvonne mentioned at the strategic level the, the issue of um, whether we're even protecting the, the, the forest that we have from development. Is that being done successfully? Th this kind of comment, um, I think, is about the level of detail that would help us with the benchmarking objectives. Um, so this is the first slide I showed you before. It's on integrated long-term planning. I walked through this before our case studies. I'll leave it up on the screen for a couple little bit, 10-20 seconds, give you a chance to glance at it uh, in case there's any comments now having heard all of our presentations. If not, I'll move on to the next uh, slide that we have not yet covered. Okay, so I think we're okay for this slide for now. Like I said, there's also an opportunity to provide written comments later. Um, and in the document that we'll share, we'll, I think it'll be a little bit clearer how this links to the survey. So the next uh, goal that we had discussed is sustainable maintenance and management over time. Um, Yvonne mentioned the challenge of getting enough budget for this, uh, the challenge of actually hitting targets, uh, uh, Mac mentioned that they've moved from measuring planted trees to measuring established trees. Um, these are some of the metrics that we've identified uh, that we'd like to have in the benchmarking survey um, because this is the kind of information that will provide uh, also information over time on whether there's progress towards targets. This is the sort of thing that even if Riyadh is quite different than uh, Birmingham, uh, you can still in both cases measure whether your trees are successfully established. Um, other points here, uh, the proportion of urban forestry budgets and other resources dedicated to tree management. Um, this is an important one to make sure that uh, you have information when budgeting uh, and of course this informs adaptive management. Are there other objectives or is there other information that you would like on benchmarks to support sustainable management and maintenance over time uh, that, that were not covered today. If, if, if so, please do feel free to take the floor now. Uh, just raise your hand or, or, or add something in the chat. So this, for example, is where I would see trees lost to development being something that could be fleshed out um, under whether trees are sustainably managed, existing trees. Okay, so uh, Naomi, I see you, it's not registering your request. Yes, thank you, Duncan. So, um, what I'm not seeing in this list is sustainable management always begins with planning and design. And I think it's important to establish the benchmarks that would drive what is meant by sustainable planning and design. What is the criteria? And I realize that would go in in more in the detail, but 
but this aspect, this critical aspect needs to be in this list because you can't establish a tree unless you've addressed all of the planning issues. And that always begins from a planting perspective with soil volume, which is one of the great inadequacies we face in the urban environment. And from a spatial development perspective, it is what are the parameters that have to be put in place in order that the that the spatial development is an ecological design. And so that needs to be incorporated into this list. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Naomi. Um, appreciate that comment. I see one from Mac. Um, just to throw out a question before Mac comes in, in response to that, would, if we're thinking about benchmarking, and the survey is already quite long for those of you who've seen it, if we have a benchmark that shows whether you're establishing trees and then you see that you're not performing on that over time, would that be an indication, sufficient indication that you need to take a deeper look at at some of the topics Naomi mentioned, or is there a need for that to be incorporated from the get-go? Because asking about soil volumes in, in one of these benchmarking questionnaires to cities seems to be quite detailed, and I'm just wondering if there's capacity to reply in a standardized way for the average city that's looking to strengthen their urban forestry. Um, so just a question for others as well. Um, but. Uh, Mac, I'll, I'll let you come in. I know maybe it was on another topic. No, mate, to be fair, it was um, it's pretty much in line with what Naomi was saying and what you were saying. Um, it's just to be a bit smarter about the, the question around planting and existing. Um, it's very great, it's great to plant a thousand small trees. It's a lot better to plant 500 large trees. And if that metric about soil volume that uh, you heard Naomi, and she's mentioned it many times, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, Naomi. It's um, it isn't. It, you have to leave that to the city forester. He knows full well with his planting site what what size of tree it will sustain. The developers, however, which you mentioned, I think Daniel, they will love to put a few small trees in that will only last ten years, even if they survive. Uh, whereas the canopy cover is really about retaining the big trees and growing other big trees, and that fifty to one hundred year gap between planting and establishing. Um, that's the that's the test. So we may have planted the trees and we may have established the trees, but did we establish the right trees? And will they make an impact long term? That was just the only point I had to really make about that. Thank you so much, Mac. No, that that's uh, that's helpful as well. Um, did we establish the right trees? I'm gonna I'm gonna. Put that question right back at you. How do we know if we establish the right trees in a comparable benchmark between Riyadh and Birmingham? I guess I think there's some level of, of local knowledge as well that we can benchmark. But I do see, so, like I see the idea from Rick on uh, the tree diameters. I mean, maybe this is a nice way to get around the different categories of tree sizes that we get in the UK versus the EU versus the US and Canada. Um, so I'm sure that there are ideas here and uh, we don't have to solve this now. Today's not about the questions. It's about uh, the objectives. And uh, if, if this is something that we're not doing well enough, then please do feel, do come through with proposals on questions when we send our email out requesting input. Um, and I see one from Brooke here as well. Trees lost to development is important, but also understanding trees retained um, and new trees gained through development. Um, so this is a this is an interesting question. Um, we've it would require us matrixing a lot of our questions to get this kind of level of detail, but maybe it's something we could put in the detailed questionnaire. In the interest of time, I think I will now um, move to our next slide, uh, and then uh, please do welcome more comments uh, via email. So the next one: adequate and predictable resources. Um, so here what we're proposing as objectives is to understand and compare financial and non-financial resource allocation among benchmarking peers uh, to better assess resource needs. Oftentimes our budgets are not going to be so comparable because 
uh, costs vary across countries, but uh, we can also look at staffing and other, other resources across countries uh, as, as another metric to compare against. Next one is support efforts by national and subnational policymakers to target financial and non-financial support at the city level. And I'll let our interpreters catch up. Apologies, I'm going a bit fast there. Um, so here, this comes back to if if the national government wants to promote urban forestry because it's a policy objective for SDGs, for climate action, for disaster risk reduction, for the new urban agenda, whatever the national objectives are, um, they can't target effectively if they don't understand which cities need support and which cities are effectively using support. So having benchmarks uh, can actually facilitate uh, the ability of national governments to, to provide resources um, and, and help ensure cities have the resources that they need. And then assess the predictability of urban forestry budgets and access to non-financial resources. Here we have an issue of it tends to be easier to get political support or project finance for big planting. It's, it's more difficult, as Yvonne emphasized in her presentation, for operation and maintenance, which is a big cost. I see Elias in the, in the chat. Uh, we had a presentation from Elias uh, last year in one of our network meetings on that. So that is the idea behind this one. Um, are there any other comments or objectives that you would bring in? This is really focusing on resources. And uh, feel free to drop it in the chat if you're having trouble requesting the floor. I see Naomi. Yeah, I would add the human resource. So this comes back to participatory management that in order to be more um, cost effective and to give a place for the actual owners of the urban forest, which is all of the residents of that urban forest, the human residents, um, those of us, the professionals, need to be more generous with our knowledge and provide opportunities with the, the background um, resource information on exactly how and why we need this to happen. But I think that this enables the, the, the management of trees to be much more um, basic. What we don't see is we don't see mulching of open soil. We don't see watering during droughty conditions. Many times the city doesn't have the resources. And if we would involve citizens with an adopted tree program or something in this vein, we would see these basic elements implemented um, much more routinely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi. Yeah, I, th I, I fully agree with you on these. Um, we did try to include a metric on trees under irrigation for publicly managed trees in our survey. Um, we didn't get into more detail under whether it's sufficient irrigation as that gets a bit fuzzy when we're, we're asking for that level of data. Um, and we do have some question looking at uh, trees that are managed privately, but I, I do think there's definitely opportunities to continue improving there, so appreciate any, any additional feedback you have there. Um, I will move to the next slide as I don't see any other comments. Um, checking the chat quickly. Um, yeah, so water scarcity, another comment. Uh, thank you, Harsh, on, on water scarcity as being an important one to think about how we can measure. And uh, so the next one, this is the second to last one, is enabling policy and governance structures. Um, so benchmarks, we've, we've defined our survey at city scale because this is where we want to see the implementation. This is where the outcome really happens. Do you have the canopy in the city? 
but the benchmark should be relevant to inform policy targets from city to national scale and you could argue to higher levels as well. Um, they should be defined in a way that's comparable across diverse governance structures. In our region we have cities where urban forests are almost completely publicly managed and we have uh, regions where urban forests are almost completely privately managed. Um, so we need to be comparable across these different approaches. Usable by cities with different levels of capacity. I've already mentioned this a couple times today. Uh, we need to differentiate between public and private land. Uh, this is linked to the resource question as well. Uh, different differentiate urban forests managed by cities from urban forests managed by other public institutions. I mean, we have cities with proper forests within the city boundaries that may be managed not by the city, but by a national institution or a subnational institution, for example. And we need to consider uh, urban conditions uh, that are different um, and aim to be declined, defined <laughs> inclusive. Um, so we this kind of refers to two. One is the 330-300 level, uh, sort of are our urban forests being developed inclusively to ensure that the benefits are accruing not just in affluent suburbs, um, but also considering different conditions. If we're thinking 330-300, is that applicable in Riyadh? Probably uh, no, those targets need to be adjusted. So any, any comments on these objectives here? Yes, this is a good point from Rocco to distinguish between city center and peri-urban fringe. So one thing, like I said today, it's a bit too much detail to get into the actual survey on this, this which we're focusing more on the objectives, but we have differentiated between urban and peri-urban, and this is actually a challenge. The UN Statistical Committee recently defined, tried to, to standardize uh, urban uh, definitions for statistics and we looked at it and it does not work for our purposes on urban forestry uh, because in urban forestry the definition really needs to be at the city level where you are defining what you consider urban and what you consider peri-urban in your management approach and so we are we are in the survey looking at that being defined by the city and providing basically the population density in those two different areas to facilitate comparability um, I had a hand from Naomi, I don't know if, and I have a hand from Gabriel Dorado. Gabriel, uh, I'll uh, go to you first. Uh, hi, Daniel, thank you. Um, so one of the things that has to be part of the the policy and governance structures is it is the cultural variables. So, for example, uh, in, in many cities in Europe, uh, street trees are an impossibility because of the way the city was constructed. That places a large percentage of the urban forest in private hands often in private gardens. And, and whether or not the trees are public or private, they are all part of the urban forest. And, and therefore, uh, uh, the, 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 how we can bring the cultural focus into how we share and, and develop the policies it has to be part of the thought process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi. Yes, no, this is this is very relevant, and I won't elaborate because we're right up on the hour, and I want to respect our interpreters and try to squeeze in one last time, one last slide here. This is the last slide for today. Uh, political will benchmarks uh, should request information on urban forestry targets. Uh, it'd be interesting to know what other cities are setting as targets. It should support clear, concise communication of targets and outcomes to constituents, stakeholders, and networks so that uh, third-party organizations like Birmingham Tree People can come in and uh, have opinions on whether they are appropriate and being implemented and met. 
they should support the identification of comparable peers uh, and the potential exchange of information, vision, collaboration, and they should be relevant to align programs and mechanisms uh, that provide support. Any other comments on political will? Key benchmarks to build political will. Seeing none and knowing that we're up against our time, I'd like to thank you all for joining today. A special thanks uh, to our three uh, presenters from outside the section, uh, Yvonne, Mack, and Brooke. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentations myself. I hope everyone else did. Um, in terms of next steps, we will send an email, which will help have more information that that's the call for input to our survey. And for cities, I would welcome you to sign up for our uh, forum to express your interest in uh, participating in our survey, uh, which will be launched after we get uh, input on, on, on the document of our uh, goals, objectives, and the actual questions. So thank you very much to all. Wishing you all a, a good morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today.